healing of physical things, healing of emotional situations, healing of spiritual situations, healings of relational discipline. In Jesus' name, you are the healer, Lord. By faith, we receive it right now in Jesus' name. Give the Lord a hand clap. Praise God. Praise God. God bless everybody. Appreciate you being here. Everybody that's online, God bless you. We're grateful to have you with us today, being a part of this service. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Amen. I was thinking uh, Sally and I have both been battling something for the last couple of weeks. I don't give it a name. It's just an attack of the devil. But let me just say this for those of you that are struggling with a little bit of faith. You know, when uh, Paul was shipwrecked, and uh, say the same thing about uh, no, uh, Jonah, there was a battle he had to fight. And so he didn't ask for anybody else to be thrown in the water. He took the, he took the battle on himself. So when I say I'm social distancing because of whatever I've got, it isn't because I don't have faith, it's because I don't know where yours is. <laughs> Praise <laughs> the Lord. So, you know what? Uh, you gotta believe for yourself is what I'm talking about. And uh, I'm praying that everybody has the same faith and that we're all standing strong. But we know in this world you're gonna have tribulations. It isn't whether we have the tribulations, it's how we deal with the tribulations. It's where we put our confidence and our trust. Amen. The enemy's going to come against you, I can promise you that, whether it's with sickness, whether it's with uh, tragic si situations and circumstances, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's physical, whatever it is, it's going to come. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning, and I want to begin and I, I, I'm going to just weave all over the place here, but I, I've had a couple of weeks here to do some studying and word searching and things, and I'm going to just, you're going to get it all, praise the Lord. But uh, let's go to, I want to start just uh, quickly here with Esther chapter 4 and verse 14, and eventually I'll get to some place, praise the Lord. But I think everybody's asking this question, and, uh, and that's why, Lord. Why is all this stuff happening? Is there, a, is there a purpose in all of it? Is it something you're doing, or is it just something you're taking advantage of because it is happening? What is it all about? And what are you going to do about it, Lord? And when? Where are you going to move first? What are you going to do? Amen? Now, you may not verbalize that, but I guarantee you everybody, every one of us has thought something on that line over the last year or two. Where are you in this, God? What are you, what, what, what is, what's your part in all of this? What are you going to do about it? All right. In Esther chapter 4, verse 14, it says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from some other place. It's going to happen. It's just a question of, is it going to be you? Or is it going to be somebody else? But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. In other words, if you don't act, there's consequences. Deliverance is going to come, but there's consequences for not doing anything. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Maybe it is about you. So I used to think, I, was, I talked to Suzanne briefly Saturday and just letting her know some things that had, had been going on and what, what we were dealing with, not just nece not necessarily about us and, you know, having the battles, but about Mike and him not being here and some other things like that. And then we got into a lot of other stuff, praise the Lord, that was far more interesting than what I had to say, hallelujah. But anyway, I used to think that, we, that we're here 
that we're where we are for a preordained reason. And I'm not saying that there isn't some truth to that, but what if, what if we're where we are and it's up to us whether there's a purpose in that or not? Because places and circumstances and encounters aren't inherently meaningful in themselves. We give them purpose. Think about it. Sinai, without Moses showing up, is just another mountain. December 25th, without the story of Christmas, is just another winter day. We make it something. We celebrate it. We're the ones that are, right? Am I just losing my mind here or what? We sanctify moments. We confer significance on time. We let God into our lives or we keep God out of them. So we can ask, where's God? But in the garden, it was God who asked the more important question to Adam and to Eve, and he said, Therefore, he's saying it to us, these are the first humans, where are you? I, I just heard this morning someone said, be a follower of Christ, not just an admirer. Ouch, praise the Lord. So let's, I want to just tell you, this is a little rabbinic story I'm going to, I'm going to share with you now, and I want to just read something from Exodus chapter 14, uh, verse 15 and 16, Suzanne. Exodus 14, verses 15 and 16. The Lord said to Moses, Where, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift thou up thy rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it, and the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. So God's saying to Moses, he's saying, what are you, what are you crying to me for? Do something. Right? Isn't that what he's saying? All right, now I want, he's praying, and according to the, the uh, like the missions that they talk about, they give you some kind of ad lib, you might say, as to what, is going on there in the in the moment, right? And they're saying, what these rabbis are saying is that, okay, Moses is praying, and he just keeps on, how many of y'all been there where things just aren't going the way you thought they would, and we just keep praying and just keep praying and just keep praying, and oh, God, show up, and what are you going to do? And and the tribes are all arguing about, well, we'll go first. We're the, best. We're, we're the strongest. We're the mightiest. We're the most powerful. Nobody's going first. Everybody's just arguing about the, that I'm going to be the first one. I'm telling you, I can do this. I'm going to do this. And, and the other one said, no, 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 I, I'm going to do this. I, I, I got it, I mean, I mean, I understand. I'm, I'm believing, man. I'm going in. And I, but nothing, nobody's going anywhere. Everybody's just talking. Praise the Lord. So then in Numbers chapter 10, I want to read verses 11 and 14. And this is about a guy by the name of Nashon. And he's, he's this captain. The scripture calls him a captain of the, uh, of the army. He's a brave warrior. And he's a early one of the first ones coming out of Egypt. He was, he was uh, identified as one of these warriors. And he's from the tribe of Judah. And that's important because that's the tribe through which the Messiah is eventually going to come. And so he's this mighty man uh, of valor. He's a real warrior. And in Numbers, this is, is there's several places, in, in fact, in, uh, in uh, chapter 10, it talks about him in 6 and 7. There's several references to him, and it's always about him being this brave person, this, this brave man of the tribe of Judah. And it says, it came to pass on the 20th day of the second month in the second year that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, according to their armies. And over his host was Nashon, the son of Amminadab. So he was the leader. He was the, the point guard, you might say, the point man for the tribe of Judah when they went out 
from the Sinai. Amen? So he was this guy acknowledged or recognized as being brave and being courageous, right? So it says that this, this nation is from the tribe of Judah, and here they are standing at the Red Sea. <coughs> Excuse me. They're standing at the Red Sea, and uh, Moses is praying, begging and pleading and wondering what's going to happen. If God don't show up, these people are going to kill me, and if they don't, the Pharaoh will. we got a problem. I don't know what's going to happen. Help me, Jesus, and come on, Lord, and do something. And the people are all arguing about, well, we'll go first. We know what we're doing. We can do this. I know I can do it. And, and this one's saying, no, no, I can do it. And all, and, and all of this confusion is going on. And it said that it wasn't a nation from the tribe of Judah just starts walking out into the water. All Everybody else is talking. Everybody else is saying what they're going to do. And, and Moses is praying. But this nation, he just starts walking out into the Red Sea. And it said that it wasn't until the waters reached his nose that the Red Sea parted. Now look at Psalm 76, verse 1. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. How was God known by somebody? In Judah, he was a person. Nashon was of that tribe, of that family. By Judah is God known, meaning God is made present through the courageous acts of human beings. Moses is praying on and on and on and on, and, and, and God's response is simply, go forward. In other words, God's saying, I'm going to be with you, but don't depend on me for a miracle. I'm depending on you for courage. And to believe in me, God is saying, is to act without fear as if everything depends on you, because it does. God, God's presence is manifest in the heroic acts of Nashon. God didn't show up independent. That's what the rabbis are trying to get people to understand. God acts when people act. He responds to our faith. He doesn't just go and do stuff, and we're sitting around waiting and, and talking and, and praying. Somebody's got to, what's the old saying? Get off the, move or get off the pot, right? I mean, do something. God doesn't do things. He doesn't just do stuff. We're involved in every aspect. Our choices, our actions, our faith, our courage moves God. Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 13 through 15. Being afraid is not a horrible sin. It's the way you react to fear. It's, it's your response to fear is where the problem is. Everybody gets afraid. Everybody, I don't care, military, bravest heroes, I can't, if they're honest with you, they'll tell you they were scared crapless at times. It isn't how scared you get. It's what you do when you're afraid. How do you respond to the fear? So the Lord said unto the woman, What is that, this that thou hast done? And the woman said, Well, the serpent beguiled me. He, he tricked me, and I ate it. And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, you're cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust will you eat all the days of your life. And I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Her seed will bruise your head, and you'll bruise his heel. All right, Genesis 1, 1. I actually have a point to make in all of this. <laughs> it may not seem like it for a while, but believe me. 
And it, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So God promised Adam and Eve that at some point in the future, a seed of theirs, someone from their progenity, from their, you know, from their children, their children's children, somewhere down the road, some of their offspring or some aspect of their offspring, amen, is going to be born who would defeat this serpent that created all their problems, right? It's another way of God saying, speaking, see, everything here is prophecy. It's all prophetic, and God is speaking prophetically when he tells this to the the woman and to the serpent that light is going to overcome darkness. Darkness is upon now. Darkness has come because of this failure, because of this, this situation. But in that darkness, God says, light's going to come, and light's going to overwhelm this darkness. Not today, maybe not this moment, but it's going to happen. So it's going to demand faith, right? He doesn't say when it's going to happen, how it's going to happen. He just says it will happen, and now you're going to have to believe for that. How long are you going to have to believe? He doesn't say. He just tells him you're going to have to believe. He doesn't even actually say that. He just speaks prophetically and assumes either they're going to believe it or it ain't going to happen, right? So this... This, uh, that's why we need prophets. And that's why we need to read the Bible prophetically. Because that's what it is. It's prophesying to us, and then it's a question of whether we're going to receive the prophet. Receive the prophet, you get the prophet's reward. That's not just talking about human beings out here prophesying. It's talking about the God of heaven who prophesied every bit of this. So he's using human beings to to represent or to to show us what he's trying to tell us from him directly. Amen? So Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 through 31. Genesis 1, 27 through 31. And I wasn't going to be here today. Sally will tell you. I had We had pretty much made up our mind, well, we'll just take another Sunday off because we still got some symptoms and... We don't know, is this COVID, is it something else? She had a negative test. I didn't get tested. I don't get tested. I don't go to the doctor. She has weak faith. I don't. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? I'm just saying, you know, she doesn't at all. I'm just saying that's kind of the way we act sometimes, you know. No, she had, she had trouble breathing. We've had headaches. We've had all the symptoms. But I know from the previous, before the Delta variant, Tests were coming up negative when they were positive, and people were testing positive when they were negative. So you can't depend on the tests anymore. You can believe on any of the rest of the quote-unquote science that they're trying to shove down our throat. It's just a bunch of crap. We're going to believe God, but I'm not throwing you under the bus simply because I don't know, right? I'm not going to come up and give you a big wet kiss when i am you know, got all this stuff going on, right? That's all I'm saying, praise the Lord. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of the tree yielding seed to you it shall be for me. And to every beast of the earth, and to every fowl of the air, and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, and it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Okay, so in Hebrew, it's a it's Hebrew is an alphanumeric language. In other words, every letter has a numeric value. They're interchangeable. Each letter has this numeric value, and numbers are written with letters. They don't write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They don't, they use letters. Amen. And the number six, the letter for man, or the, the, the number for man, right? We just read it. The sixth day, God creates man. That's the number of man. The number six is written with the letter 
Vav. V-A-V. Vav is the sixth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it's the first time that it's seen in the Bible is amazingly in Genesis 1 and 1. And there it's used as a conjunction. And. God created heaven and earth. Bob, God created heaven, Bob, earth. So I want you to look at this Bob. It literally connects heaven and earth. It, con it, it It's the connection between the two. It's a conjunction, but it's connecting those two. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they broke the Bob. They broke the connection between heaven and earth. Praise the Lord. I said I wasn't going to come today, and, and I, I listened to a little bit of a message from, uh, I don't even remember who it was now, Kent Christmas, I guess it was, and he was saying stuff that I had already had in a message. He wasn't saying the exact same things, but the things that he was saying were pointing to the same thing that I already had in this message. This was Saturday, no, Friday night, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you need to go, and you need to preach this. You got the message already, you just go ahead and go. Just do it. And, of course, I'm saying, well, you know, I mean, somebody might catch this. And he said, just, you know, you just need to go. I went downstairs and I told Sally, I said, I I'm going Sunday. And she said, what? I thought we weren't going. <laughs> I said, you don't have to go. I'm going. I just, I know that God's telling me I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to preach this. She doesn't have any faith, I'm telling you. See, it's all me. No, and she, here she is, and I didn't say anything any, any more about it. I'm just saying, I just know God's telling me I need to mess, I need to preach this. So, when he, that's just wanted to say. So the Bob is this connection between heaven and earth. Now we've already established that Bob is six, and that represents the man. So I'm not going to go any deeper in that right this moment, but I'm going to go off into all kinds of other stuff just to show you how faithful God is to His prophetic word. Ruth chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Ruth 1, 1 through 6. <laughs> this is one of the first messages I ever preached. With famine in the house of bread. The first verse after Judges, there's no king in the land. And it says at the end of Judges, and everybody did what they thought was right in their own mind. And then the very next verse, everybody's doing whatever they thought was their own mind, right in their own mind. And the very next verse is Ruth 1, and there was a famine in the land, in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem, the house of bread. Anyway, praise the Lord. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread, the tribe of Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. And they came into the country of Moab and continued there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Chapter, uh, okay. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Ophrah, and the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelled there about ten years. Nalon and Chilion died also, both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. So she was a widow with no children anymore. And she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Verse 16 and 17. And Ruth said, I entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go, and whither thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people will be my people, thy God, my God. Where thou diest, will I die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. So 
Ruth is one of those sons' uh, widow, Naomi's daughter-in-law, and the one Orpah, she goes back to Moab, but Ruth refuses. She says, no, I'm, I'm with you. Your God's my God. Your people are my people, and God curse me if I leave you for any reason other than death. Praise the Lord. So it's, first of all, the first question that comes to your mind is that Elimelech, why would this man from Bethlehem, Judah, seemingly a devout Jew, why would he leave there? I know there's a famine there, which he's, it's telling me he doesn't have any faith or trust in God. And he leaves there to go find a better place, and he goes to Moab. Moab are sworn enemies of Israel and have been ever since the Exodus. And he goes, he takes his family and he goes to the Moabite land. And Moabites hated Jews and Jews hated the Moabites. But that's where he chooses to go. And it's like bang, bang, bang. Naomi's husband's dead, and her two sons are dead. Who had Moabite wives? And it implies that they died prematurely. And the reason they died prematurely, because they were in disobedience to God. God was upset with them. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 4 through 7. I'm not going to try to go this way, but I'm just going to say this because it's on my mind, my heart. I don't, I don't talk politics rarely. I have a couple of times I've got off on a rip here but where I just you know, got kind of overwhelmed there. But we're not of this world. We're in this world, but we're not of it. And what I think one of the reasons the church, and this is just my opinion, God knows I'm just a, a nobody in a little church in nowhere land. But the church quit trusting God and started trusting in another country. I love the United States. Great country, or at least it always has been. I was willing to make the sacrifice to, I didn't plan on giving my life for it, but I put myself in a position where that could happen because I felt that was the responsibility of a citizen of this country. But I've since learned that some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we better be trusting in the name of our God. Amen. Governments change. And when we put our confidence in a government that hates God, that is anti-Christ, that is against everything that God stands for, we're in Moab, buddy. And it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing the consequences of that. Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor, of Pethor, of Mesopotamia, to curse you. He's talking about the Moabites, and he's talking to the Jews about what the Moabites did and didn't do to them. Nevertheless, the Lord thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but the Lord thy God turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because the Lord thy God loved you. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he's your brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because you were a stranger in his land. Who do you abhor? The Moabite. Praise the Lord. 
Remember Abraham and Lot, they had a choice, right? And Lot went to Sodom, and he lost everything. Lot actually separated himself from God's provision, from God's protection. He did the very same thing that Adam and Eve did. He believed something. He believed what he was seeing, the well-watered plain, instead of what he knew in his heart, what God had told him. Lot's daughters thought that uh, the world had come to an end. I mean, they didn't have CNN, Fox News. All they had was what they could see with their own eyes, and what they could see with their own eyes is everything has just gone away been destroyed. We're the only survivors. The world's come to an end. We're the only ones left. So they got their father drunk. This was rational thinking, wasn't it? They got their dad drunk so that they could get impregnated by him. It almost sounds like the world that we're living in. This sounds like something that might be taught in school now. I know it's Kate. I know, I know this is crazy, but I'm just saying it's that sick. And their sin birthed two nations, Ammon and Moab. Ruth was a descendant of Moab. She was a Moabite or a Moabitess, a name that literally means from my father. Not my heavenly father, my father. Remember, by the time of the Exodus, Moab had become Israel's hated enemy. They were, they were despising each other. And Lot and his family were only saved. We're making the comparison here. They were only saved because of Abraham, because Abraham interceded, right? Abraham got between God and judgment. So we already read the king of Moab is the one who hired Balaam to curse Israel. And, of course, that didn't work because God said, you can't curse what I bless. So that didn't work. So they came up with a plan. And the plan was to get the people of Israel, or the men of Israel at least, to commit sexual sin or idolatry with the Moabite women, to compromise, to be attracted by their flesh. A stimulus check. A booster. A mask. I just, listen, I just read this yesterday. In California, they, they re-elected this halfwit and he passed a law immediately after he was put back in office that Sleepy Joe was all a part of, and that was to limit private home ownership, their properties, now they have to subdivide. If you have a house in California, you're going to have a neighbor right on your lot. So the lots cannot be more than four feet on either side of your house. You can't have more than a four-foot yard. So basically what they're talking, it's either got to be a, a duplex or a house right next to your house, like a, like a condominium thing. So there'll be no more private property to speak of. And what they're saying is they're doing away with the suburbs. There'll be no more suburbs. They'll just be densely populated cities. And the reason is, because they want people to, you can't have a driveway that will hold more than one vehicle. They want you to use mass transit. They don't want you to drive. Global warming. Give me a break. This is a law. This is a fact. It's it's gonna ha it's happening now. It's the law's already been passed. 
If you live in California, you're living in apartment houses from now on. That's all there's going to be. Or just the same as an apartment house. You step out your door, you're literally on your neighbor's porch. Praise the Lord. You get what you want. They voted them halfway in. Now they can, they're, they're going to have to suffer. The, the bad thing is not everybody voted for this clown, but everybody's going to pay the price. There's a cost for compromise. There's a price. So Balaam just said, hey, I know we, we can't get them. We can't cur God won't curse them. Let's just get them to compromise. Praise the Lord. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying without me having to spell it all out. Okay, so Ruth's commitment not to separate from Naomi and her God is seen as a correction or a repair for Lot's decision to separate from Abraham. God made a prophecy that somehow, someway, through this, through your seed, is going to come somebody who's going to crush that serpent. Well, Lot blew it. He separated. He turned his back on God and went after what looked like a good thing, physically, in the flesh. But Ruth repairs that breach, basically, is what the scriptures are teaching us, trying to get us to understand. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a little bit. But So Naomi says, I'm not leaving, I'm not separate. You, you're going to have to kill me to get me away from you. Your people are my people. Your God is my God. We're, we're one. Amen? And so that's her decision. Heals or, or repairs Lot's decision. Both of those, think about this, they were both human choices. Nobody made either one of them do th these things. They made a choice. Lot made a choice to do his thing. Ruth makes a choice to do hers. So Ruth's kindness to Naomi brought God's favor. And by bringing God's favor, she got Boaz's favor. Ruth and Boaz's marriage was a restoration of the, res the relationship between Lot and Abraham. So why, you know, why does it matter? Well, I'm going to show you in a roundabout way. Abraham was a Jew. Why? Because he crossed over. That's the only thing that made him a Hebrew, right? That's what the Hebrew word meant, was to cross over. To, that he crossed over the, the, the waters, right? Lot didn't. So we're talking about Jew and Gentile and a separation. Stay with me because I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But the story of this Gentile Moabite, Ruth, and this Hebrew Boaz from Judah, by the way, that's the tribe that he's from, because their relationship laid the foundation for the genealogy of King David and ultimately Jesus, the Messiah. And we, if you look at, if you just look at this, it seems so convoluted and so conflicting and so confusing, and yet it is perfectly the way God does everything. And the reason I'm saying all this, not just to give you a bunch of information, but to get you to understand if God ever made a promise, He's going to make it come to pass. I don't care how conflicted and outrageous it might seem, but it takes you to believe. He's not going to just do it. Somebody has to make a choice. Somebody has to believe it. But if you will, it is in stone. 
He will make it come to pass. Whatever he has said, it has to happen. His prophecies are not questioned. Look at Ruth chapter 4. I want to read verses 13 through 22. Ruth 4, 13 through 22, just to establish this. Most of you know this because you, we've all heard the story of Ruth before. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be, made, may be famous in Israel. Now, one of the other things you can just throw in here is Ruth gets all her stuff back. She gets her property. She gets her home. She gets her, her uh, identification, her who she is in Israel. All of that comes back to her, too, as a result of this, this person's faithfulness. This person's choice didn't just affect her. It was affecting everything. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life. Talking about this baby. A nourisher of thine old age. For thy daughter-in-law, which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons, hath borne him. And Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom and became a nurse unto it. And the women, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi. It's like her own kid. And they called his name Obed. He's the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez beget Hezron. Hezron beget Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot who? Nashon. And Nashon begat Salmon. Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Can you see how they were weaving this story of Nashon walking into the water? See, they had never gotten out of Egypt, except for one guy had the courage to step out in something that looked totally impossible and believe that somehow God's going to make a way. While everybody else is arguing about who's the bravest and who's got the most faith and who's going to do this and the other one's over there praying and carrying on, one person just said, let's stop this BS and just somebody do something. Quit talking to me about it and let's just see somebody act. Praise the Lord. There's four women named in genealogy. Four women in the genealogy of Jesus. They're the ones that are identified. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. <laughs> oh, boy. Those are the women I was wanting to date when I was, you know, 16. <laughs> if you follow me, praise the Lord. These were not nice girls. These were naughty girls. But why only those? Why those four? Because God's trying to show us something. It's the naughty boys and girls that God can use. It's the screw-ups. It's the failures. It's the ones that the rest of the world points their finger at and says, what a loser, man. There, there, nothing's going to happen there, Tim, right? You'll never amount to anything. No, not in God's eyes. He goes and looks for these people. And singles them out. Not the most prominent, not the most noteworthy, at least from a positive perspective, from the natural. But they were chosen because they were Gentiles who had failed in miserably in their natural life. But they played key roles in building the line of Judah and the genealogy of the Messiah through the house of David. God could have chosen the most perfect. Righteous, holy, wonderful women. But he didn't. And he's talking about how I'm going to get into this earth. 
the holy, the righteous, the almighty God. And he says, I'm going to find me some losers. And I'm going to make them winners. Because if they'll trust me, they'll be more than overcomers. They'll be the righteousness of God in this earth. And what I'm getting at is it takes Jews and Gentiles to build the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of God is not male or female. It's not Jew or Gentile. It's a conglomeration of all of them. It's not just the super spiritual and the ones struggling to find their spiritual identity. It's the whole package. Praise the Lord. John, look at John 17, verse 20 to 23. John 17, 20 to 23. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I've given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I and them, thou and me, that they may be made perfect and one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Wow. So I'm believing today that the Ruths, in the metaphor, the the analogy that God's giving us are the non-Jewish Christians in today's world. And Boaz is the believing Messianic Jew. The one new man. Because like Boaz, Jews cannot fulfill their destiny without the Gentiles. Jesus would have never come without the Ruths, without the Rahabs, without the Tamars, without the Bathshebas. We need each other. That's why Israel is not, God's not done with Israel. I don't believe anybody in here believes that. We are one people. I was, uh, Suzanne and I were talking. I had just heard on uh, a little bite from some, I don't even know where it was coming from now, but that when we go to heaven, there's 12 gates. Each gate is for a tribe. We got to be in one of those tribes, folks. I'm not saying we're Jews. I'm just saying we have been made one. We, we have, we have been grafted in. Our God is a Jew. We're going through one of those twelve gates, folks. Praise the Lord. David, we know, was a type of Jesus, a, sh a shadow of the Messiah to come. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 13. Praise God. Ephesians 2, 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Who's he talking? He's talking about Gentiles. Verse 17 and 18. came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them which were nigh, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. Praise the Lord. What's he talking about? Repairing the vav. Repairing the connection between heaven and earth, the new man. Oh, <laughs> See, Ruth is the perfect example of somebody who wasn't everything the world thinks they need to be. Ruth was destitute. She was a widow. She was a foreigner. She was hated. She was racially discriminated against. 
She came from a people that were hated. But Ruth said, I don't care how much that your people hate me. I'm not getting separated from you. Lord, you're God. You're my connection to your God. And I don't care what I got to go through. They're going to have to kill me to keep me from getting there. And her loyalty, her faithfulness, her trust opened the door for Gentiles to be a part of the genealogy of God himself. Ruth opened the door for anybody who thinks that they've come short of what God's looking for. The primary reason for the book of Ruth is literally the genealogy that's listed at the end of the book. It's all just pointing to that. It's, it's a great story, but the truth is it's just about some babies being born. The promised seed of the woman the Messiah. And that genealogy connects David to Perez, the firstborn of Judah. Remember, we started with Adam and Eve, and they sinned, and the connection between heaven and earth, the Bob, is broken. The Bob is missing in every... Now, here's what, where it gets really interesting, and I know I'm going long here, but the Bob is missing in every genealogy going forward as a reminder of the disconnection between heaven and earth, between God and man. The physical and the spiritual that took place as a result of the fall, the separation of man from spirit. Look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. And I'm going to just show you some things. You can go back and look them up because there are uh, Strong's Concordance can even give you this information. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4 says, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth. The generations of both the heavens and the earth. When they were created. And in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. That's the first time that the word toldot it's T-O-L-E-D-O-T, -E if you want to look it up. It's the first time that it's ever used, and it is genealogy or, or generations. It's translated both ways. And that Hebrew word is written with two bobs. But after Genesis chapter 2 and verse 4, the next time it's used is in Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Let's look at that. So after here, the next time it's used is here in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. So that's told out again, used again. This is the book of the told out of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man in the likeness of God made he him. So the genealogies of Adam. But here, and this is where it gets weird, the word told out is written incorrectly. Intentionally, but incorrectly. It's it's written defectively here because it's missing one of its letters. The first bob is there, but the second bob is not there. In fact, every other time you can go through and look this for yourself, it just blows my mind. Every other time that the Bible uses the word told dot from here in, in chapter 5, verse 1, forward with the exception of one place that we'll get to, it's always written defectively. Every single time. It's missing either the first or the second vowel. It always has only one vowel in it, and that's incorrect spelling. And we know those Hebrew scribes did not misspell anything. They wrote it exactly the way they were told to write it, or they would burn the entire manuscript and start over again from the scroll. So what's the mystery? When would that Bob be restored? Matthew 16 and verse 17. Excuse me, Matthew 4, verses 16 and 17. The people which sat in darkness saw a great light, and to them which sat in the region in the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
Praise the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places. You can see the connection between heaven and man again, both directions. Us going there, it coming here. When the promised messianic seed of the woman came, the only other time after Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, that the word toldot is written in its full form is Ruth chapter 4 and verse 18. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot and on and on until Jesse begat David. That's the first time it's used correctly, spelled with both vowels. Amen? The word told out is written in its full form. These, these are the generations of Perez. So that missing Bob alludes to the promised Messiah. This messianic seed is going to come. The seed of the woman who's going to defeat the serpent. It's coming through the line of Judah, through David, who was born of the line of Ruth and Boaz. And ultimately, it's through the son of David that Jesus is going to come and restore, like the restored Bob in Toldot, the connection between heaven and earth. Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. And God is so perfect, so intricately woven through everything that he does. No mistakes. I'm telling you, you get a prophetic word. It's a done deal. It, he'll, look, he's moving heaven and earth. He's, he's taking Gentiles. He's taking these women that nobody else would have. Anything. He's doing whatever he's got to do, and it's going to happen. Suddenly, there came a sound from heaven. Hmm. I wonder what that might be rushing mighty wind and what and it filled the house where they were sitting and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them and they these men these humans were filled with heaven filled with the holy ghost and began to speak with other tongues as that heavenly spirit gave them utterance the reconnection the bob is back Hallelujah. He'd remove the defect that was caused by the fall, restoring the fullness of God's blessing for all of humanity, symbolized by the word generations written in its fullest form. These are the generations. These are the real deal. These are the generations of heaven and earth. Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. This is... It's just, it's just un unbelievable. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In Hebrew, David's name has three consonants, Dalet, Bab, Dalet. The middle letter of David's name. middle letter of David's name is Bob. The letter of connection. The letter that brings man and God back together. David was a man, the Bible says, after God's own heart. And it's because he wanted more of God. He wanted something deeper in God. He wanted this intimate connection with the Lord. That's why it's so weird how he had this Kind of, it's almost like an innate understanding of grace. So long before there was any grace, but it was in him to make that connection, to be that man after God's heart. And what was the heart of David's intimate connection with God? God's word. 
you come to me with a spear, and I'm coming to you in the name of the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Ephesians chapter 1, 17 to 20. Ephesians 1, 17 to 20. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints is. Folks, we, we, you, you got to get this. This isn't just about David and Jesus. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Praise the Lord. John chapter 4, verse 24. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Word and spirit. Both David and Jesus embodied that. They didn't just believe the word. They acted on the word. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. David, everything he did, he did because God said it. I, he could have killed Saul. He had opportunity. And instead of that, he cuts off the hem of his garment. And he's ashamed of that. Why? Because God said, God had anointed him. He said, touch not my anointed. The word of God. He knew the word of God. And he, wasn't, he was ashamed for having even messed with it. He went for years knowing that God had told him that he was king. But he would not move that other person out because he knew that God would do it. God had prophesied that he was king. And God's going to make me king. I just have to stay in faith. I just have to believe it. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 23 and 24. See, I don't care. I guess I do care that I'm not perfect. But I don't care that other people find out that I'm not perfect. Ezekiel 34, 23 and 24. And the reason is, God likes imperfection. I'm not bragging about having flaws. I'm just saying those flaws do not hinder me from hearing from God. They do not hinder me from being able to operate in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. It might rub people the wrong way, but it does not stop God from using flawed vessels. doesn't mean I don't want to be better. It just means that I do still screw up. But my confidence is not in Nathan. My confidence is in the prophetic word of God and what he has said about Nathan, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. No weapon formed against me can prosper. Every tongue that rises in judgment against me, I have the right to condemn it myself. This is my heritage as a child of God. And I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, and even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David, a prince among them, I, the Lord, have spoken. David, praise the Lord. Jesus, the good shepherd. Right? Micah chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Micah 5, 1 through 3. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm actually winding down here. Glory to God. Micah 5. One through three. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughters of troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Praise the Lord. We're in good company, being little and nobody. God likes that. 
because he's able to show himself mighty. Praise the Lord. Matthew 2 and verse 6. O thou Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel, and his name shall be called Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and there'll be no end to his government. Praise the Lord. So in Jesus, the dynasty of David remains on the throne. A seed and a throne. Those are the two great promises of the covenant. And let me tell you something. It may sound blasphemous, but the truth is they are as important to us as Jesus himself. Because if those promises were not true, Jesus would have no value. We'd have no guarantee of him being who he says he is. Of him being the seed that would crush the head of the serpent. We're seated with him in heavenly places in the spirit. We are, listen to what I'm saying here. We are the seed who must endure forever. We are in Christ. We are Christ in this world. We are the body of Christ, individually and collectively. We are protected. And get this, we have been dubbed kings and priests by God himself. The king whose royalties, plural, are to last forever. That's us, his royalties. Bob, heaven and earth reconnected. We're now that connection. We are now the Bob, the connection between heaven and earth, the human, the man. Matthew 16, 15 through 19. We're so much more. Nothing to brag about. We did it all. But we're just so much more than we have any clue. He saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Well, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. Why? Because he had a revelation of this seed, this reconnection between heaven and earth. And it didn't come from any place but God himself. And that's why Jesus was so excited about it. When people were saying, oh, he's, the, he's this great rabbi, he's a great teacher, he's a, he's a prophet, he's a this, and Peter said, no, you're, the, you're that Bob. We've been waiting. Listen, the Jews knew this stuff. This was taught in their synagogues all the time. It's, it's new to us, but it was not new to them. These were the things they went by. These were the things they were looking for. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood is not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Upon this truth, upon this understanding of revelation, upon this understanding of prophetic truth, I'm going to build my church. And what are the gates of hell not going to prevail against? Prophecy. The prophetic word of God. When somebody, when some human will have the courage to act on it, not just because it's there, but because somebody chose to be courageous and say, I'll do that. With a snotty nose and a cough, I'll declare I'm healed in Jesus' name. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to put this on me. I'm just saying when we're, when we're limping around and we're doing our stuff and we're struggling with our own thoughts and our own imaginations and our own failures and we're standing here saying, but I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Look at me, devil. Look at these hazels and listen to what I'm saying. I am the righteousness of God in Christ and you are under my feet. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Praise the Lord. Yes. 
and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Matthew 18, 18 through 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you, who? The connector, the vav. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. You're the, you're the intermediary. You're the connection. So whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. Praise the Lord. Again, I say unto you, if two of you can agree together on earth as touching anything, ask, and it'll be done to them of my Father which is in heaven. Praise God. We need to step back and realize Jesus has never and never will break a promise to us. We experience God's love, God's grace, and God's power because he said so. It is finished. It is written. His seed is established forever. From creation to today for eternity. Close with this scripture, Psalm 76, verse 1 again. Back to where we started. In Judah is God known. His name is great in Israel. In people, God is known. He's great in his people. By Judah, by courageous humans, heaven and earth connect. And God is made known. The Bob, the sixth day, man. God said it was very good. Very good. Let me just paraphrase this, and we'll close with this right here. Esther, if you all together hold your peace at this time, then the enlargement or the, the power and deliverance will come from someplace, from somebody. But you and your house will be ruined. You'll suffer loss. You'll be destroyed. But who knows? Maybe you're come for a time just like this. You're the Bob for this time, for this place, for this moment. And the only way to prove it Take a chance. Step out in faith. Say what he says. Go to that hospital. Tell that man you're going to get out of that bed. You're going to walk home. You're going to be healed. No weapon formed against you can prosper because we're standing instead for you. What we bind on earth, God's binding in heaven. What we're loosening on earth, he's loosening. We're loosening healing and deliverance. We're binding the work of the devil. We're binding his sickness and disease and his lies to come against us. And we're loosing the power of God Almighty. That's our responsibility. It's our privilege as the Bob, as the connection between God and man, between heaven and earth. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. So don't let somebody tell you because you struggle with with the reality of your faith. You just keep on believing what God has said in, in the face of whatever the symptom or the lie or the enemy is trying to tell you. By his stripes, I'm healed. My nose may be running, but you got a problem with that. I don't. I'm healed in Jesus' name. Right? I, I, the doctor may have said you got cancer. I'm telling you, the doctor doesn't know. The devil's a liar. I'm healed in Jesus' name. By his stripes, I was healed. You ain't going to have money to pay the bills. 
My God supplies all of my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. There is no lack in my life. I have more than enough to take care of every situation and every need that I have. Praise the Lord. I'm bigger than the devil, and he knows it. I can slap him around like a red-headed stepchild. That's horrible to say I have red-headed grandchildren. I'm just saying. It's just a, it's a way of talking. He's nothing. He's a nobody when we stand in the authority and the power that we have as the boss. He's just a dirty little spirit under my feet. In Jesus' name. Say thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. That's your identity. Go and live in that identity. Live in that truth. And every time the devil comes, you remind him of who you are. I got three letters for you, bud. Bob. And you can take that to the bank, buddy. God bless you. Anybody wants prayer? Amen. Be happy to pray for you. Suzanne will if you're intimidated by me. No, it's nothing on you if you are. Praise the Lord. Uh, but if you want to pray, if anything, whatever, we're open for that. Otherwise, you are dismissed to go in the power of his might in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a great week. Be blessed.